Bad attitudes like a flat eye, you can't go very far with it. Gratitude, on the other hand, is the fuel that determines your altitude. Altitude, in this case, refers to success, growth, status, progress, promotion, prosperity, etc. etc. I'm sure you get my drift. What's the linkage between gratitude and attitude? Gratitude is attitude, but attitude is not necessarily gratitude. This means that not every attitude conveys gratitude, but every gratitude is an attitude. Attitude is a conscious or unconscious state of mind which could be either positive or negative. Our attitude determines our reactions to things, people, situations, events, actions, words, etc. One of those reactions is gratitude. I have chosen to speak about gratitude today because it is an attitude that's in short supply. As I reflect on the trajectory of my life, as I observe my world, as I examine the supposedly ordinary occurrences of my daily existence, I find that I have every reason to be thankful. I have millions of reasons to be grateful. I can beat my chest and say, if not for God, my story, your story, our story would have been different. God found me worthy to be a receptacle of his blessings and even Grace Avenue. I commit daily to walk on Mercy Highway and Glory Lane is my destination. I'm saying that God is and has been with me every step of the way and I'm eternally grateful for this. I don't need anyone to tell me that I'm special. God loves me. There's nothing I have done to deserve his love. But God loves me. God has been merciful towards me. He showers me so much love that I unconsciously act sport. My coming and going every day I see his goodness abound towards me. Some people say to me, it's okay for you to talk the way you talk because you have been lucky. You are wrong. I haven't been lucky. I have been blessed. I have been so blessed that I have been struggling with how to demonstrate to God my gratitude. What can I do to show God how grateful I am? Who am I that he chose me to bless me? Why am I, oh Lord? This is the question I ask every day. Why me? In every sticky situation, I saw your love. In the darkest times, I saw your salvation. I have never felt alone and abandoned even when I tried to run from him. In my imperfection, I saw his perfection. In his perfection, I saw my imperfection and I eventually understood there's no such thing as a perfect person in the Bible. Instead, we find a large number of figures who are well acquainted with sin. Take Abraham for instance. Surely we know that Abraham was a good God-fearing man. But when he encountered a dangerous situation, he didn't hesitate, not for one second, to put his wife in harm's way to save his own skin. Yes, Abraham was a man who argued with God and fought for justice. But when the situation involved members of his own family, then he didn't get involved. And while Abraham found great success in his lifetime, increased his wealth many times over, at his death, he didn't share any of it with his followers. In fact, he even neglected the rest of his children, leaving everything he acquired, his material and spiritual possessions to just one pair, to Isaac alone. We also find flaws in Moses who grew up a prince in Pharaoh's court. Early in his life, Moses killed a man. Years later, when God called to him at the burning bush, Moses looked for a way out, pleading with God to send another in his place. And during the years in the wilderness, Moses grew so angry with our stiff-necked ancestors that when they were afflicted by hunger, thirst, plague, and war, he was not beyond letting them suffer a bit before taking up their cause. In the end, after leading the Israelites to the promised land, not only was Moses not worthy of bringing them in, he wasn't even allowed to enter himself. Like Abraham, Moses was acquainted with sin. Perhaps the best example I can find of the imperfect man is David, whose story is told in the first and second books of Samuel. David was still a young man when he defeated Goliath and made his name. This was the first of many battles for David. 
In his lifetime, he was a skilled fighter, a musician, and poet. He wrote the Book of Psalms. He was an emotional man with intense passion, which he expressed to his friend Jonathan, his lovers, his wives, as well as to God. David remained loyal to King Saul, even when in fits of rage Saul tried to kill him. David captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites, hence its name, City of David. Finally, after becoming king, David used his charismatic personality to bring the tribes together and form a united monarchy, a kingdom that lasted through his and Solomon's reign. And yet, despite his glorious achievements, David was far from perfect. In fact, he committed one of the gravest sins that anyone could ever imagine. Late on the afternoon, David was looking out over the rooftops of his city, admiring the view when a beautiful woman, Bathsheba, caught his eye. David told his guards to bring her to the palace where he learned that she was married to Uriah, the Hittite, who was serving in the army, fighting to enlarge David's kingdom. This didn't stop David from having his will with her. A short while later, Bathsheba told David that she was pregnant, and David in trying to cover his sin, arranges for her husband to be sent to the battlefront where he is killed. When Nathan tells David that he has sinned, a contract heart like this the world has never seen. The depth of his sorrow as he cried, I have sinned, continue to reverberate throughout the ages. The Jews tell us that there are three kinds of special prayers. There's a prayer offered by Moses, an exacting line by line, word by word, letter by letter prayer. God responded to Moses' prayers like no other, but only after he received every line, word, and letter. Then there was a prayer said by a king. David said this prayer better than any other king. It wasn't quite as efficacious as Moses' prayer, but still, God would hear it and eventually respond. Finally, there's the prayer of the poor. This, did you say, is the most special prayer of all because God always listens to the prayer of the poor. When such a prayer is uttered, God pushes aside all the other supplications that surround him and responds to it first. So how did David do his dance? How did this king, this sinner, this jester maintain his honor and preserve his life? How was it possible for him to be called the Messiah by the Jews? I will tell you. Instead of using the prayer of the king, David learned to say the prayer of the poor. The prayer God always hears immediately. The prayer God always responds to. But how is it that a wealthy man, a king, could be entitled to offer the prayer of the poor? According to Zohar Midrash, God treats everyone who is broken-hearted as if they were poor. Anyone who honestly looks into their hearts and soul and sees their own thoughts and shortcomings, God will immediately respond to their prayers. David was a great sinner, but boy, he knew how to dance. Read a few of his psalms and you get to know a man who knew the depth of his soul. God may despise the sinner, but God loves those who dance. Psychology tells us that there is a connection between sin and redemption, that we cannot be whole until we look into ourselves and find where we are lacking. Only after we know what our sin is can we start to find a way towards redemption. But knowing our sin is not so easy these days. We live in a world that has idolized perfection and is entertained by failure. At a time when gossip no longer needs coffee at Starbucks to spread, others' mistakes are ever present, patiently waiting to be acknowledged on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In this environment, this instant information age, is it any wonder that we try to hide our flaws and shortcomings? Is it any wonder that we are unwilling to admit them even to ourselves? Too many of us walk around wounded, not only by our mistakes, but by the pain caused by trying to cover them up, trying to maintain the illusion that all is well. We hide our imperfections, sometimes by living defensively, by finding fault with others, 
we are afraid to look in the mirror and accept our own responsibility. But you and I, we have a choice. We can pretend to live, ignore our feelings, avoid the truth, live an existence that's accompanied by a dull ache that never goes away. Or we can face our fears, acknowledge our sins and shortcomings, become aware of the heartache, sorrow, and loss we have caused ourselves and others. We can face our fears because we don't want to keep pretending. We can face our fears because we want to live fully, free and unburdened with hope and joy, promise and peace. This is not an easy road to take. It's not for the faint-hearted. But unless we are able to be honest with ourselves, our lives will never change. We will keep working on that treadmill, claiming that everything is fine, everything is dandy with only that dull ache in our soul to remind us that we're just fooling ourselves. Christianity has never asked us to be perfect. It doesn't tell us not to fail. What it tells us is that God, the one who created us, understands our nature and knows that we are not perfect. Not Abraham, not Moses, not even David was perfect. But that's okay. God doesn't want us to pretend to be something we're not. God wants us to be honest, to speak the truth to ourselves, to ask forgiveness for our failures, to grow and become whole. David used the poor man's prayer because he knew that he was a sinner. He knew that he had caused sorrow and pain. He knew that he deserved to be punished. But David also knew that there's nothing God loves more than a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's where attitude and gratitude meet. This is where they collide their points. Realize that Perfection is only through faith and not through works. A few days ago, a lady told me how God had been showing her the flaws in her and how she needs to work on herself. She felt quite justified in the works of self-redemption that I didn't quite know how to tell her that God no longer sees sins or flaws. He sees us through Yehoshua. Only the devil sees sin and flaws. Only devil points this out. In understanding that God loves me, irrespective of my imperfections, I can't help but dance like David. I can't help the gratitude that courses through my veins. I can help singing songs of praise in the shower. As I sleep, my soul praises him. God has been so good to me. I don't know what your story is. I don't know how perfect you are, but I want to tell you that in my imperfection, God found me and made me whole. He blessed me and mine. This is my attitude, an attitude of gratitude that has filled my altitude. God has been good to me. God bless you all.